It is episode 15 of the Audio Barnyard podcast. With Don Barnes, I'm Donnie Barnes. We are brought to you, as always, by VOJumpstart.com, where we teach you how to produce better audio faster and more easily. Today, we're talking about Audacity versus Studio One. This is a topic that comes up quite a bit in the different you know, voiceover and audiobook groups that we're in. Of course, it's no secret that we're advocates of Studio One. We believe it's a terrific uh, option for narrators and voiceover people and podcasters. But Audacity, of course, is very widely used. Both of us actually started on Audacity. A lot of people do, partly because it's free. But Audacity kind of gets a bad rap sometimes in the voiceover community. There are some people that look down on folks if they're on Audacity. We don't do that. Look, if you're having success and you're making money and you're figuring it out in voiceover, that's hard enough to do as it is, no matter what software you're using. So hats off to you. Again, we both did that too initially. Um, so Don, why do you see Audacity getting a bad rap in some of these online groups sometimes? Yeah, well, it's a little bit unfortunate. I feel bad sometimes. You know, I don't want to pile on to it. So we're going to talk about its strengths and its weaknesses. First, it's free. That's awesome. Uh, one of the other things that happens every time and that helps people be comfortable is that the first time they open it, when they go to record, instantly they can record by pressing one button and it creates the track for them and they're off and recording. And I don't know, I don't, I don't want to say it's a false positive, but it's almost like I have COVID, but I've, I've tested too early and therefore I don't know that I have it. It's kind of a, that's a, a loose analogy there. But when you start, the first thing you do to record, boom, it works. And so what happens is then they get into some other product Studio One, Reaper, Pro Tools, all these others, and their setup can be more complicated on day one, and their productivity gains are just off the chart when you get a couple days down the road. So uh, for the price, obviously, Audacity is amazing, um, but while a lot of people don't see it on day one, as you said, what are some of the differences offered by a, a more powerful DAW like Studio One? Yeah, well, we're gonna, we have a whole set of things. So on day one, boom, you're recording. The problem is, is that even if in most situations, if you're doing audiobooks, if you're doing podcasting, if you're doing voiceovers, we do some processing and we have to meet ACX specs if we're doing audiobooks. So we have a whole set of things that are going to happen before we have a finished product. Studio One is template based. So on day one, they don't give you a whole big massive setup because you could do 400 different things with it. And so what we want to do is, and we have it all set up. Once you get the templates in place, you can have the exact same experience you have with Audacity, but you get some higher quality audio when you're using all the tools in Studio One versus something like Audacity. One of the issues that we like to talk about with different DAWs is their punch and roll functionality. And we had an earlier episode where we talked about how and why punch and roll can change your life if you master it and if you do it well. And part of that is having a DAW that not only supports it, because every DAW in theory supports punch and roll these days, but it's very different the way it does that from one DAW to the next, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. And, and that's kind of like everything else in life. It's just because I call it the same thing doesn't mean it is the same thing. Pizza's pizza, uh, hot dogs, hamburgers, whatever, all your food that you could ever buy. Any restaurant could do one of a hundred things. There are good, better, best implementations. And behind the scenes, one of the things that's happened in the whole DAW world is that everybody has seen that punch and roll is a superior way to record. So they've added it on. But adding it on after the fact is like, okay, I have a restaurant that's successful and I'm doing Mediterranean food and I'm doing really well. And I decide that I'm going to add Italian pizza to that. Can I do that? Of course I can. But my restaurant is set up to be a certain style and Studio One, from day one, they knew they were going to do punch and roll. So their file format behind the scene is totally engineered to allow them to not only do that, but do that at a level that can't be done when somebody does something like, this is one of my complaints about Audacity. Audacity, Twisted Wave, some of the other DAWs, they added on punch and roll late in the game. But what they didn't do was what they really should have done was rebuilt the architecture that actually is the file format. Well, I won't, I don't want to get all, totally in the weeds about every detail of that. I should talk specifics though. Behind the yeah, scene. What, go yeah, ahead. I was going to say, what are some of the specific situations where having that sort of ad hoc or post hoc bolt, bolted on punch and roll that, uh, that Audacity has, for example, where can that cost you as a narrator? 
So let's say you have a, a, a narration you've done. You've got a 30 minute chapter and you made, and you need to punch in at the three minute mark. If you go and use the punch and roll in audacity at the three minute mark, what it does is it cuts off everything from three minutes to the last 30 minutes, whatever, anything beyond the point where you're punching in is now thrown away. And then you're restarting at that point where, and part of that is because behind the scenes, what they have done is each little file segment that are, that are being tracked in the background are numbered sequentially. And so what the software is doing is it knows that if I'm at, at segment number three internally, then I go to the next highest number that's in my list. I might have 200 in a row, but it skips some numbers. So I go number three, number five, number seven. I'm always going up in the order. And because of that, if you need to go into number segment number three, it's going to wipe out everything beyond that. And it might be segment number 200 now if you had done a bunch in between there. But what you end up with is because it wasn't built with the understanding that we could have segments in the middle, segments coming in later, it doesn't handle it gracefully at all. It just throws it all away. So something like Studio One, in the beginning, they knew where they were going with punch and roll. And so right at the beginning, they architected it to where you can go in and punch in just a little fragment at the three minute mark, at the 15 minute mark, at the 30 minute mark, and it won't disturb anything beyond that or anything before that. When they tack it on, they have some problems that they have to deal with. So then yes, they can do punch and roll. Yeah, so it's it's kind of like if you if you weren't in shape at all and you hadn't worked out for 20 years and then you thought, oh, bench presses, bench presses are a thing that people do and I should do that too. And then you just go in the gym one day and do a bunch of bench presses. Maybe you can do them, but A, you're risking a lot of injury and B, your whole, your foundation isn't really set up to do that successfully yet. Studio One is basically like a DAW that was working out and in shape the whole time. And so was ready to accommodate that kind of load that that punch and roll does place on a DAW because that's not an easy thing for a for a piece of software to do unless it was built for it. Uh, absolutely, it's actually funny. They kind of got frustrated where they were losing business to the the more advanced DAWs, and so these other the DAWs that have been around a while that weren't built for it basically said, "Okay, we have to come up with a way to do this so we can say we have that feature too." Otherwise, they were going to just lose business to everyone else because the world has figured out that doing punch and roll overall is a better way to do it. And I will say this, I'd rather have audacity with the punch and roll that it does rather than no punch and roll, but it doesn't compare to something that was built from the ground up. And some of it has to do with the internals, the way it was designed. And if someone wants to have a deep conversation about that, I'm happy to do that. All right. If you want to geek out on this stuff with me, give me a shout. Well, I can go over very specific technical reasons, but simple example. Every time you start a new segment in Studio One, it automatically puts in a 10, sec 10 millisecond crossfade. Now, who cares? I mean, like my mom, 10 millisecond. How long is 10 millisecond? No one knows. No one really cares. But here's the point. If you don't do some of those things, then you could get a little click at the point where you move from the original segment to the next segment. Studio One knew it was going to do punch and roll. They built in the 10 second, but you can adjust it later if you need to. Audacity was smart enough to go, ah, these other DAWs allow you to adjust that. Well, we can't allow for the adjustment, but what we can do is we can put in the 10 millisecond, but then you can't adjust it later. So you get, you get where they couldn't do exactly what the more advanced DAWs did. So they do a part of it. And they did the best they could with the file format they dealt with. And so it's a cool thing. They're trying to do it, but they have all these limitations because their foundation is not built for it. I can't build a pickup truck on the frame of a little car that was designed to, you know, be one of those smart cars, uh, you know, that holds two people and that's it. Now I'm going to try to build a pickup truck on that frame. I might be able to make it look like a pickup truck but it's not gonna have the same suspension. It doesn't have the same engine. It's not built to be a pickup truck and do whatever, you know, I'm gonna tow a vehicle or something like that. So your frame and your beginnings are not set up to do some of the things you can do with the more advanced DAWs. Let's talk about development cycle, because that's a really <laughs> sexy thing to talk about. <laughs> yeah. But it is important when we're, when we're talking about a piece of software that we're going to base our entire voiceover or narration or podcasting career on, it is important to talk about how that software gets made and how it gets updated as we go forward, right? Because if we plan to do this, hopefully, for the next 10, 15, 30, 40 years of our lives and careers, 
that becomes an important thing to know before you select a DAW, isn't it? Oh, very important. But it'd be the same as I have children. Do you know that, Donnie? I have children. I, I had heard a rumor. <laughs> okay. So here's what happens. Uh, a lot of guys my age, I ate, I ate Twinkies. I ate Ho-Hos. I ate more sugar when I was a young guy than, than it should, be, should have been legally allowed. Okay. My grandfather used to let me drink Mountain Dew, and he limited me to three Mountain Dews per day. Now, my kids never, they, I don't think they knew what Mountain Dew was because my wife, so the younger generations, people now, what they do is they just know if you start with weak ingredients and you're eating garbage all day long, then you have a problem. Well, when it comes to development, uh, the people that are developing something like Studio One, they have budget. And they have a crazy budget because Studio One comes out of Persona, so people don't care about this on one hand, but they should because it has to do with their future. The Studio One development team in hardware, they're doing about $100 million a year plus. So Studio One's the glue that holds their whole world together. All their hardware stuff, Studio One can be part of that. It'll work with anything else in the universe as far as audio stuff and interfaces, but they have budget. Well, what does that mean? They can hire people that are probably salaried. Well, I just know this. I've looked at their development team. I've seen the education and skill level they have. And they have a development team that's being paid over a million dollars a year just in salaries to develop the product. And Audacity team is absolutely off the charts amazing for free. Uh, that they get donations, uh, but they don't, most of them are not audio engineers before they did this. And they may decide, oh, cool, I want to do that. But most of them have not been audio engineers. They didn't go to school for it. They aren't specialists. You have this whole little cultural thing that happens too. Uh, just like in the United States, there's Harvard, or let's say I want to become a lawyer. There are some elite universities around the world that if I say, hey, I wanted to be a lawyer and I'm, I'm Harvard, Harvard educated, well, I don't know if that's the only one, but Harvard, Cambridge, uh, what, else, what else is there, Donnie? Yeah, you know, say Oxford, Yale, oh, any of the Ivy yeah, League okay. schools generally. Sure. If you, yeah, yeah. So that's the point is that I don't know if those are the best, but there, there's a, there's a lot of brain power goes there. If they want to be an attorney, they kind of think. And if I want to be a musician, I go to New York, I go to L.A., I go to Nashville, I go. There's a, there's a, some centers around the world that if you want to be a musician, that's how I ended up in L.A. Okay, mm -hmm. because there's a group of people that you can work with and. Since the standards are so high in L.A. and New York and Nashville, and there are some other places, and if you go there as a musician, man, you get, you get, whoa, I cannot believe how good everybody is. Well, there are some places in Germany where Steinberg is there, Yamaha is there, Studio One, the, the, the team is there, and I do not know why. I don't know if it's the water. I don't know if it's the air. I don't know what has attracted so many world-class audio professionals are located in this part of Germany. And they attract them. So what you end up with is this very expensive, but very highly educated and competitive team that's sitting out in Germany. And while Personas is an American company, their software division, the primary developers sit in Germany and they are unbelievably educated, nitpicky, pain in the rear end about audio quality people. Okay. They're nice people, but they just, they're, they're just no compromise on audio quality. So simple things like the effects that are in Studio One, I, 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 I'm very, I, I feel bad about this, but the limiter in Audacity is is borderline terrible. It's just okay. Um, the compressor that's in Audacity, I, I just every time I hear it, it's like, oh, I want to, I want to, I, I just feel, I feel bad for for people because for the price of Studio One, eighty bucks for Studio One artists, they've got somebody who sat around and spent three months working on just a compressor or just a limiter. And these are people that already are super educated about that one little subsection of audio. And they have invested heavily, I mean, crazy amounts of money in the little details that make the compressor in Studio One sound way better than in almost every other product. And some of it is they have millions of musicians also using this and they want sound quality. So. You have all these different levels where the development team is higher educated because they pay a lot of money to hire people and they're in a region where if I go out to a nightclub at night and I say, well, you know, I do audio, I'm going to run, probably run into somebody else that goes, yeah, me too. I, I might be at a competitive company. 
but that's a little epicenter of development excellence for audio. And it's like, I don't know why. Okay. But if I were a young guy and if I aspired to be a developer who was doing audio related type things, I would probably go live in Germany for a period of time because there's so many great people there. And the Audacity team, I always just say, man, hats off to you guys, because that's nitpicky little stuff uh, that you have to become really good at. And they're not getting paid enough to make it that they can pay for more education. They're not around a bunch of other people that this is their passion, that this is all they think about all the time. I like passionate people, okay? I like working with teams of people that they have a passion about whatever they're doing. That's something I look for. And Studio One has that in spades. And Audacity has great people, but their education level and who they're around, it's just not the same. There's, there's different worlds from that perspective. Let's talk about that ease of use thing, because you mentioned that at the top. And that is something that it attracted me initially when I first got into voiceovers. And I, I had already used Audacity just to record my my sports broadcasts for a while. So yeah, it seems very easy and intuitive when you first download it and, and, and open it for the first time. I've come to think of it the way um, the, people have to go through this little learning curve when they start swimming. And I'm still not good at this yet as, as sort of an aspiring swimmer, right? Where when you first start swimming in the water, you don't, it's hard to learn initially how to breathe correctly while you're mid stroke. So it's, it seems easier to just keep your head up out of the water while you swim, but that's actually a much more taxing and less fast way of doing it, right? And so if you can get through that initial little learning curve of learning how to breathe while you're mid-stroke, you get much faster, much smoother, much easier long-term, and you'll end up being much more healthy. But it is that initial little hump that you have to get over, and there's yeah. a similar thing with Audacity versus almost any other DAW. Yeah, it, it, absolutely. It'd be the same as riding a bike. I mean, I, I'm going to fall over probably the beginning the, when I rode a bike as a little kid. And you have to learn how to get going fast enough. And then once you're there, it's like, oh, this is easy. So here's the thing. Audacity on day one, you start and press record, boom, you're there. And Studio One, you do need to get your template set up. But once your template's set up, not only can you walk, literally do the same thing, you walk in, press record, boom, you're ready to go. But in the background, you have 20 other things set up for you that continue to save you time that actually make it easier. The embarrassing thing, and first off, I didn't start with Audacity directly. I started with an analog recording studio, cutting master records, doing that first. Then when you, my young son, started doing it, I thought, oh, I can learn Audacity because Donnie knew it. Donnie's the one that got me into this business and he was using Audacity. And I go, well, I'm not going to force him to learn my stuff or what I think would be right. I'm going to do what he's doing because I just thought I'll be a good dad. And I didn't think this was going to last, meaning I, at that point, did not expect to be in this business. So I went ahead and did what Donnie was doing, which he's doing Audacity. And I go, cool, cool. I can learn whatever. And I already knew the principles. And then I got frustrated by all sorts of little things along the way. And that's when I started my exploring other things and then dragged him kicking and screaming into Studio One. Because Almost literally. What's that? Almost literally kicking and screaming, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was normal. So here, yeah. I'll give you a simple example. Do you remember how do you uh, how you turn down a little segment in Audacity? So I want to make it quieter, a little segment. Let's say a breath. I want to bring down a breath in Audacity. Do you remember how to do that, the menu? Yeah, you had to go up to the menu. I, yeah, do you remember? A, yeah, there was a gain down option. It's been a while since I've used it now, so I don't remember specifically. But yeah, you had to go up to the menu at the top and enter a specific value. Right. So yeah. here's what it is. I'll just tell you, because I uh, the you use the amplify command. You That's go right. effects amplify. But yeah. here's the weird thing. Uh, ask your mom, ask your sister, anybody who's not in audio, okay? And say, if I want to turn something down, what command would you think I would use to turn something down? If you say amplify, amplify to most people think is going up. That's going to be bigger. What they don't know is it's super easy to go into amplify and put in a negative number, minus 10, minus 20, minus 6, whatever. That's easy, but it's not obvious, nor is it intuitive. But there are so many people that have used Audacity over the years that you could go in any group, any place and go, ah, I got to turn down this breath. How do I do it? Oh, it seems so hard. I can't find the command. I see amplify. I don't want to amplify. I want to turn down. So then someone would go, ah, Don, you're an idiot. Just go ahead and put a negative number in there and it'll work. And so people, then I go, oh, that's easy. I didn't know it was there. So 
anyone who's using Audacity at first, they don't know that. It's not intuitive because the command is actually backwards of what I want to do. But there's so much common knowledge out there that it only take five minutes to find somebody that knew that. So that seems easy. But here's the thing. In Studio One, you highlight what you want, the breath. And if you double click on it, then you can just drag it down with your mouse and you visually see it get smaller, get larger and adjust it and listen to it. It's actually much easier to do it in Studio One than it is in, uh, in Audacity, but it's not obvious. And an Audacity user would never think of highlighting it and that they can do this little drag thing and drag it up and down and visually change it because they couldn't do it over there. Uh, if I'm riding a bike and it doesn't have gears and then I get a bike that has all these gears and so I could change the stuff, I don't even know you can do that if I've never been on a bike that has all the different gears. So I would just ride the bike and if it's in a wrong gear, I keep riding it and it's like, ah. All right, so you end up with this very interesting thing. It is easy in Audacity, but it's easier in Studio One, but I might not see that. And here's one of my little frustrations. Most of the people that are using Audacity use it because of, quote, ease of use. There's actually an easier method in Studio One to do the same thing. They just don't know where it is to begin with. And I see the inverse of this whole thing. There's some people that have started with Studio One, and then they go and they try to, they got, this one lady told me, she's probably 60, 60, 70. I hear all this, how easy Audacity is. She said, she just started with Studio One. I download it. I don't get it at all. And it's simple things like, She's used to being able to, if she's going to cut, copy, and paste, she was new enough that she didn't know the keyboard shortcuts for cut, copy, paste. Now, they're easy in both the programs, okay? It's kind of, that's a fundamental of just computers, but she didn't know it. But what she did know was, I can't remember what cut, copy, paste is, but if I right-click on my audio in Studio One, it gives me a little context menu that has cut, copy, paste right on it. If you're in your audio in Audacity, you are missing a whole boatload of shortcut menus that if you, you try to right-click on your audio, it's not there, okay? So it ends up being that there's 25 to 100 little details that once you know, oh, once you know about right-click, something that an Audacity user wouldn't do because they've tried it and it didn't work, then they don't try it on the next DAW that they get because they didn't do it in one. So anyone who starts with Studio One ends up with more coming out the back end that are meeting specs, doing less work, <laughs> Your mom does less work than most people that are doing audiobooks because she's got it all set up for her. She pulls up her template. All the details are there. She exports and she instantly has mastered audio because the setup is all there. So that's way easier, even though it doesn't always seem that way. Let's talk about autosave because this is something that it doesn't come up that often for a lot of people. Now, if you're on an older computer, it might come up a lot. If your computer shuts down unexpectedly all the time, this is an especially big deal. But even if you have a brand new top of the line system, you're still going to have times where your computer shuts down or there's a power surge. Things, things happen and you're in the middle of a recording. Maybe you hadn't manually saved in a while. You forgot you got on a roll. You've been recording for an hour and whoops powers out. Well, well you have a couple studio... of things going on here. For Studio One, for example, there's a built-in autosave that yeah. they put in at the very beginning. And so by default, if you don't do anything, every five minutes, it's autosaving in the background. And then if you say, and it's actually very clever the way it does it, but here's the other thing that's happening. As you record, so let's say you record a two second, uh, a two minute segment or a 20 second segment, and then you stop and you re-record. Behind the scenes, it's saved that little segment to disk. So as you do the next little segment that could be 20 seconds, two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever it is, it's already saved all the previous off to disk immediately. And so if something went wrong, if your machine crashed, you're only gonna be within five minutes and no one buys Studio One or no one uses it for, for that kind of thing, but they built it from the beginning for creative types who sometimes don't always pay attention to technical details. And those creative types get involved with whatever they're doing. And so the autosave, uh, right? Well, are you, are you saying musicians sometimes are, are not the most grounded mentally? <laughs> well, yeah, I got to be really careful because I, I, <laughs> since I'm one of them, they are the best people in the world for that of kind of course. stuff. No, it totally works out that 
we get involved. I, I have to, I'm guilty, guilty, guilty. And he knows I'm guilty, which is why he cut me off there. It's like, <laughs> I get involved. I'm like, blah, 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 you know, and then squirrel. And then I'm off to another creative thing. It works out that uh, Audacity doesn't do autosave partially because of the way they are managing all the things in the background and no one will buy it. But there's 20 other little safety things that are behind the scenes. For example, if I have my audio that I recorded two days ago and I had made a change to it volume wise, I could go in a week, a month, two years from now and get it back to the original size of the audio, the original volume levels, I should have said. Uh, because behind the scenes, it's all saved for us. If I had if I had taken and accidentally deleted a little take and I come back in two weeks later, that take is still available to me to go retrieve if I ever need it. it you have this belt and suspenders thing where behind the scenes, Studio One is doing a bunch of little things so that musicians who have their hair on fire doing other things who aren't paying attention to every technical detail uh, when something goes wrong they can go retrieve their audio and get it back easily. I don't even go over it with most people because they might go two months or two years and never need it. Then the one day they have something go catastrophically wrong, they call me up and we go, ah, no problem. Let's go back and we get that whole thing back in five minutes and it's pretty cool. So it works out great, but it's not why they buy it to begin with. And that that autosave functionality is is part of a, a broader concept that Studio One is really good at that Audacity just isn't, which is non-destructive editing, right? Where Studio One is constantly saving things behind the scenes and you can constantly go back and get past takes, past versions back within the, the same file. Whereas Audacity, once you record over something, whatever you recorded over is gone permanently. Yeah, and they... It's a different world, but part of it comes back to what we talked about earlier. The foundational design was assuming that I might need to go back to something. And because of that, audio that you recorded yesterday is still there unless you go behind the scenes and you get rid of it manually, which means you've made a decision to do that, then it's going to be there. Now, they do give you a one button thing if you want to go in and you want to clean something up and, and get rid of all the stuff that you aren't using. But by default, is designed knowing that creative types we get, we're doing this. I'm, I'm focused on getting the job done. I'm not focused on picking up after myself. That's for the cleanup crew later, right? They're going to come in and clean up after me. But while I'm being creative and doing my real work, I don't want to have to think about all those details. And Studio One behind the scenes does that in spades. Yeah. And so long term, the productivity that you can have with Studio One, once you learn how to use it well, it's just you give yourself a much higher ceiling with Studio One than you do with Audacity, don't you? Yeah, it's almost embarrassing because I do see people that just don't realize how much extra work they're doing. Uh, everything around Studio One is, let's say you have a, so I'm, I'm going to be a chef, okay? I'm going to pretend. I have a sous chef. And that means they, they do all the chopping for me. And then I just put it all together and I look good. I, I think I'd be great on a cooking show, by the way, if I could get all my minions to go ahead and chop up a bunch of stuff and get all the ingredients set out. And they, they measure this for me and they measure that for me. And I, being the super chef, go, oh, cool. I grab that, pour, 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 stir, 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 presto. I mean, I think I'd be great on one of those cooking shows. And you could think of Studio One that way. It's your little sous chef that's going ahead and, and has all the components pre-measured for you, pre-worked out, pre-in place. And then you as the chef, you got to put in the big stuff. You need to put it together. But because you have all these helpers that are sitting around in the background, it turns out to be a lot more productive. And it is almost embarrassing how much, how little work people do once they're set up. But you know what? If you don't have any sous chefs at first on day one, you have to do the little chopping yourself. You need to get together the ingredients. You need to go get them out of the cupboards. You need to go find them to the first time. But as you get that going, there comes this crossover point in the first few weeks where it's like, oh, I can do a lot more cooking than anybody else because I've got all these assistants doing all their little stuff. So it turns out to be pretty darn killer once you're past that first stuff. And of course, we're nutcases. I got all those templates set up for people that are part of our courses, just as a commercials thing here. But you could do it yourself without those. I mean, I did it myself. A lot of people can. But if you ever want, I could buy a good pizza crust and I can buy a bad pizza crust. Uh, there are companies that put out stuff that is great, that's pre-made. There's a bunch of things. I don't. I could go to Costco and get a chicken that's already 
cooked, a rotisserie chicken type thing if I want. You can go get parts of your meal already pre-done. You can buy. And that's what Studio One's about, where it's like, take all the stuff, have your sous chefs. It's all sitting there. You do the final combining. You put it on nice plates. All right? You go buy a meal from some restaurant that's a good restaurant and it comes in little paper things. And what do you do? You put it on nice plates. Everyone goes, wow, that's pretty cool. That's the that's good stuff. So that's really kind of the concept that we're working on here. Yeah, you have to go out and start and get your ingredients together. But once you have your act together, it's amazing how fast you can put it all together. All right. So three things as, as we wrap up today. One, if you're watching this and, and you love audacity and you you think it's superior and you think we're totally uh, mistaken in everything we're saying, well, hey, we'd like to hear from you. That's fine. We're, we're happy to talk and dialogue about this stuff. Again, as we said at the beginning, we're not here to uh, cast aspersions on or look down on anyone using audacity. We just happen to think for a lot of reasons that Studio One is superior long term. But hey, Happy to hear from people that think otherwise, and maybe we'll do some some uh, some response videos if people have objections or things that they think we missed. Uh, secondly, if uh, if you want a system, as Don just said, that's set up for you with pre-made templates that are designed for voiceover narrators, podcasters, audiobook narrators, you can get that at vojumpstart.com. And if you want to talk to Don for free first where he can walk through a lot more things, because that's the third thing I was going to say. There's a lot more reasons why we think Studio One is the superior DAW. We didn't have time to do all of them here without this going a couple hours. But so there are a lot more reasons. And if you want Don to show you some of the things, because it's easier to show rather than tell, you can do that over at vojumpstart.com. Just click to schedule that free 15-minute chat. And sometimes, this is an industry secret, but sometimes Don will even talk to you for a little longer than 15 minutes. <laughs> Absolutely for free. He loves to talk after all, so he's happy to do it. And again, no pressure, no obligation. But if you decide it's right for you, we have those pre-made templates and courses showing you how to get set up with Studio One and get that jump start. That's why it's called S1 Jump Start. All of that over at VOJumpstart.com. So until next time, for Don Barnes, I'm Donnie Barnes. We'll talk to you soon. Have a great day. Bye-bye.